You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Today is going to be another little grab baggy kind of day. I've got several projects lined up in the docket as far as things to talk about during this off-season time. Off-season. Goodness, bye week. I've, I've, I've just shut it down already. <laughs> We're in the off-season. It's cold and it's dark and it's horrible and I'll never see the Packers again probably. So that's that's what I turn into when I have a week with no Packers. Um, but they they deserve a little bit more attention trying to fully think these things through. So we'll do another grab baggy day. Maybe tomorrow I'll have one of those queued up. And then obviously Saturday and Sunday we have football to talk about. So that's the very rough rubric of what's going on this week. I'm pretty sure it's Friday. I am so, so messed up. Does my computer tell me right here? It's too slow. Never mind. Yes, yeah, Thursday. One of those mild panic attacks. I was like, I don't know, man. I think it's Tuesday. Might even be Monday. You might want to check that. It's like, I, I, you don't even, I will, I'm just not going to work if it's Monday. I'm so sick. But it's Thursday, so I'll, I'll go. Anyways, as per usual, if you wouldn't mind getting yourself in the Packernet Podcast Facebook group and liking the Packernet Podcast Facebook page, I made some changes. Because again, this is you know my this is my goal for the entire 2020 year, so it's going to be rocky. But I'm making some progress on the messaging system. Because again, my goal is to build a brilliant robot that you can just if you want to just hang out and talk Packers to a robot, you just go ahead and do it. By the time 2020 is done, that's that's the goal. Too ambitious, but that's how all my goals are. I don't set dumb goals. I set unattainable goals and then miss them and then get depressed like a man. So, anyways, what else? iTunes reviews, if you haven't done that yet, a five-star iTunes review would greatly help the show. Also, I figured something else out, or at least have an idea. I tried to give away a t-shirt in the Facebook group. Um, Let me just check how that's doing, by the way. Apparently, the goal was a little too lofty, and we never quite reached it. We can still go for it, though. There is a pinned post in the Facebook group. If we get to 100 shares, somebody's getting a free t-shirt. But here's the other thing I want to do. Um, Any form or fashion of a donation to the show will enter you into a contest. And every month I want to do a different kind of a giveaway. And one dollar equals one entry. I'm going to start off this month with just a t-shirt from the Teespring store. By the way, if I would encourage you to um, check those out for the playoff run. I mean, come on. But this month I want to start with that. The goal, obviously, hopefully be the more people join, the more money coming in, the more I'm going to feel comfortable having bigger and better and awesomer prizes. For example, if if there's any chance I could be giving away Packers tickets by the time the football season starts, that would be amazing. Maybe I could even set it up in tiers. You know, like if this much gets donated, we'll give away a t-shirt if we get to this. Maybe I'll do that. For now, just we'll say it's a t-shirt. But I don't want to give away a t-shirt if there's a flurry of people. Anyways, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. I do have some people that have used Patreon, etc., etc. That's also fine. I'll just make a note of it. And again, it's just $1 is one entry. And then also, if you have any ideas for what you think would be cool, because it's not really what I would like, because that's irrelevant, because I can't win, because I'm certainly not donating myself any money. I don't even like this podcast. But let me know. I think that's it. I never really know. And I usually get upset when I move on and forget something. Oh, I know. I wanted to say a special thank you to Jim and also to Todd. Their giving was a little above and beyond, especially Jim. No offense, Todd, but, you know, especially Jim. Thank you both very much for the uh, for the donations. And then another special thank you to Alan for joining Patreon. First new patron in 2020. All right, let's take a break. We'll get after it. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. 
Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. So it's actually been a pretty nice winter in that the cold hasn't really hurt me yet outside of that stretch in like October. But you know once January hits, it's all over. That cold and snow is coming with a vengeance. It's time to gear up. And if you're going to do it, let's do it right this year and get some quality premium clothing. I'm actually wearing my Mack Weldon hoodie right now in the basement because it's cold down here. And I'm telling you, this is incredibly comfortable. So do yourself a favor and head over to MacWeldon.com. They make it super simple to be able to navigate their website. They got everything from underwear, socks, tops, and bottoms. And then, of course, they've got some fun little accessories like slippers, hats, scarves, gloves, bags, wallets, whatever. If you're just falling in love with the quality premium products, they got some extras for you. They even have it so that if you go over to accessories, they have a category called cold weather. You can click on that and just get completely geared up for winter. And as a bonus for being a Packernet podcast listener, Mac Weldon is going to give you 20% off your first order if you visit MacWeldon.com today and enter promo code OVERTIME. Again, that's 20% off your first order. Just enter promo code OVERTIME when you visit MacWeldon.com. And remember, they've got that special deal on any underwear that you get. If you don't like it, you can return it and keep the pair that you have, and they'll give you your money back, no questions asked. MacWeldon.com and use promo code OVERTIME for 20% off your first order. So I want to start off with a question I posed to the group and that is, what are your, some of your New Year's resolutions as Packers fan? Obviously, I can only read about two or three of them, because you guys are crazy. But let's run through that. Anthony says he wants to make it to at least one preseason game and one regular season game. And Daniel followed that up with, save up so I can make it to a game in Indianapolis next season. It's, a cl- it's as close to home as the Pack will get to me in a while. So those two are actually pretty cool, because it is something to think about. Because I know for me... It gets to be about that time, and then it's like, oh, I should really go to a game, but I don't have enough money. I don't know if you knew this or not, but if you set aside 10 bucks a month, by October, you've got $100. That's $200 if you can squeeze away 20 bucks, $20. Just get a little envelope somewhere, or, I don't know, something else you could put it in that you probably won't lose. And when you get a 20 in your wallet, just slip it in there and act like it never happened. Because you know you're going to waste that 20 bucks anyways. The other reason I bring it up is I've had... I think three separate people reach out in the last week and say that we need to do a Packernet podcast hangout for a game someday. I'm very strongly considering doing that. It's a matter of how to do it. That's the biggest question. Obviously, it's simple, but I'm a textbook overthinker, so I'm trying to think of some kind of gigantic thing. But if it does go down, it would be nice if a bunch of people had some money set aside so that they could actually go. And so I might want to give you fair warning now. Start saving your pennies so you can go to a game. And even if you don't want to come to my event which doesn't exist yet, still, set aside a couple bucks this month so you can go to a game next year. Home game, away game, doesn't matter. Pick one that you think is going to be the most important, figure out in your mind how much it's going to cost, and set aside that much. Because on a month-to-month basis, 10, 11, 12 months out, it's not that much money. You could save up for a playoff game if you want to, and then if it looks like they're not going to make it, just take that money and dump it into whatever game's coming up. Just start a little Packer fund. Anyways, Andy says, enjoy the playoff run, evaluate today's team with honesty, look to the 2020 season with excitement. We are at the start of the tidal wave swell. I really hope so, because I'm doing my best to not say negative things about a very positive thing, but I just worry. You know, we saw with the Chicago Bears and Matt Nagy, just the absolute fall off. We've seen that with a lot of teams. I mean, look at the Panthers after they went to the Super Bowl and lost. They couldn't even, did they even go to the playoffs the next year? And so, I mean, the, the good thing is, The Packers have exceeded pretty much every expectation that I've had. I mean, there's a couple that I was hoping for, you know, especially in terms of, and yeah, I know I'm going to upset people again, but in terms of Aaron Rodgers' productivity, I was hoping we'd see something closer to 2012, 2011, because it's just going to be scheming people open, and he's just going to be nailing people left and right. And that's not exactly what's happening. But, you know, there was a lot of fear. Is Matt LaFleur even going to be a good coach? Are we even going to get to six wins this year? I mean, nothing was for sure. We didn't know if the defense was going to get better or worse. We didn't have any idea about anything. And so it's still going to be a wait and see. But so far, there's been a lot of fears. And Matt LaFleur and the group have done a good job of overcoming um, those fears in general. Especially when you consider the the main goal is to just be a, a team that can win. And that's exactly what they are. Justin says, try not to break anything in my house during the playoffs. Um, it's one of the good things about getting married and having kids 
Because if I wasn't, I would probably go out of my way to break something if we lost. Just, just because it would feel good. I can't do that now. I'm trying to convince my wife that football isn't a terrible thing. She's not a big fan. She doesn't like how obsessed I get, how much time I dedicate to it. Fortunately, there's a little bit of money coming in, so she doesn't exactly totally hate it all the time. But if I went and broke something after a game, no more football in the house. And my kids wouldn't be allowed to watch it with me, so I have to keep myself under control. So the lesson here, Justin, and I guess everybody else, is to marry someone you love, but that can take everything from you, (laughs) and you're terrified of them. Because you want your kids to grow up to be gigantic Packers fans and not make you watch football in the basement by yourself. Ben says, be realistic when it comes to off-season expectations. That's fair, but I really just think that means if they lose, try to be cool with it. Because there's there's not that many options. <laughs> you can lose the first game. You can win. I mean, it, it, you, you can win one, two, three games. So I guess what I'm saying is it's not that much more realistic that they lose the first game than it is they win the Super Bowl. But yeah, trying to have a little bit of context, I guess. Trying to be okay with whatever happens. I think I can... Well, that's not true. If they lose, I'm just going to be a basket case. And I'm going to have to do a podcast, but I'm going to need to, I don't know, really, really calm down so I don't just lose all my listeners because I'm going to be in a rage. But I think as long as it's not like a blowout loss. You know, if the Saints come into Green Bay or whoever it is, and we lose 35-3, to that's going to be painful. Especially since the narrative going into this game is that they're frauds. And if that happens, that narrative is going to carry on all year long. See? Told you they were frauds. They didn't belong to begin with, and they got treated like frauds. A a real playoff team would never get beaten that way, which is just not true. It happens in the playoffs. It happens in the Super Bowl sometimes. Seattle Seahawks, not very long ago, beat the, uh, this was 2015. I'm sorry, 2014. So it would have been the 2013 season, 2014 Super Bowl. Seahawks, 43. Broncos, 8. So, no, that's not the case. The Broncos weren't frauds. It just, they just got whooped. I've also had 48-21, 34-7, 34-19, 49-26. Just going way back in history here, but I mean, I'm just saying it happens. 30-13, to 52-17, to 37-24. Man, 49ers, Broncos. Man, the Broncos have got a history of just getting spanked in the Super Bowl. 55-10. to 10. Back in 1990, the 49ers beat the Broncos 55-10. to 10. Oh. Anyways, you get my point. Sorry, I get lost in that sometimes. Actually, seems like it happened a lot more often in the past than it happens now. I would have thought it's the opposite. It's a lot less parody, which I guess kind of makes sense. I was thinking about this going down this rabbit hole. With technology being what it is, I really think it helps level the playing field. There was a time back in the day when scouting players was just like... I mean, there, there would be guys getting drafted that other teams probably didn't even look at once. You didn't have... I mean, you, you had film, but it was like, what, reel to reel? I know they had VHS back in the day. Lots of different stuff to try to find ways to get film. And it just, it, it can create a disparity. If you got one organization that's really good and really organized at finding good talent, you could really stack a team. And then, you know, salary cap management, you know, Wolf took advantage of some changes and really just raked everybody over the coals. I mean, in, in a very good way for the Packers. Just He just understood it better than everybody else. Went out and got Reggie. Nowadays, it's like, but, and that's the, that's the reason why when we go to the draft, you can guess 75% of the picks accurately. Because not only does everybody, even including fans, know all the prospects, but they have a good idea of what the teams think about the prospects because some of this information starts leaking. And then other teams know about what other teams think. So it's almost like every team has the same board and every you know, it's just with some variation and parity in there. But you end up with teams that are just very, very similar. Anyways, random thought. Of course, there's going to be some... You know, one team's going to have the Lamar Jackson and, and some good defensive players, and some teams are going to have the Pat Mahomes and Tyreek Hill combinations. Sometimes stuff is just going to click. But in general, trying to really pull ahead, especially year after year, it just doesn't really happen very often. Uh, Nico says his resolution is to not listen to Booger on Monday night until next year. So I'm actually really upset that I'm not in on this Booger thing. I don't have ESPN, so I don't ever get to watch Monday. I got to watch last Monday because I was at a hotel. Christmas present for the kids, not for me. I mean, well, I'm lying. That is entirely, entirely false. I very much wanted to go there as well. But even in that game, like I, before the game started, I was like, all right, I got to get tuned into whatever Booger's talking about. And I just, I, I 
the game was over and I wasn't even thinking about it and everybody started quoting all the nonsense he said. It's like, I don't even remember that. How did I? I'm just so in the zone with the game. I'm not even listening unless there's like, the only time I even hear the announcers is when they're reviewing something and they always get it wrong and I go into a raid. I don't know. I don't see a lot of contact there. It's like, I'm going to just, what are you talking about? He pushed him. And it's always against the Packers. Every single time. Every time the Packers get a call, it's always, I don't know, there's not much there. Anytime there's a no call, I think that's a good no call. And they're wrong just about every time. The only time that they're right is when they say something against the Packers that happens to be true. Because sometimes the refs get it wrong or whatever. But they're never, ever wrong in the favor of the Packers. Like, that wasn't really a penalty. Like, I'm looking at it going, eh, I don't know, that was a little ticky-tack, and the, and the announcers are sitting there going, oh, that is just blatant. They would do it the other way, but never for the Packers. I just, I can't, I can't stand it. And finally, Brandon says, to take over the organization and turn it into a money laundering system. I would be disappointed uh, to not have a team anymore, although I suppose the team could still be in operation. And since Brandon's in the group, I would hope that maybe he could make me the official Packers podcast, maybe throw a couple of those those dollars my way. Just don't tell me about it. You know, I don't want to know. We, when this thing, when, when the FBI and a bunch of other federal organizations come raiding the Packers organization, I just, I want to be able to say, I didn't know a single thing, man. It's my only request. And and also just stay uh, stay away from the team outside of making a bunch of money. Let's, let's keep Gutekunst in place and stuff, all right? Otherwise, yeah, I'm, I'm for it, man. Let's do it. Anyways, moving on to another comment that was in the Facebook group. This one from Dustin. He said, something that can be very positive concerning the Lions game was essentially the second half and how they found a rhythm. He says, I almost think winning the way we did helped us prepare better and get more focused. The momentum we achieved in the second half may lead to better performances down the stretch. Twelve quarters till we reach our goal, boys and girls. I think there's a lot of truth for a lot of different reasons. My, my brain is firing on all kinds of weird little rabbit holes here. Number one, that's a great example of the Green Bay Packers in general. They find a way to win, right? Things are going terrible. This team is not playing like a team that wants to win. But then they f- something clicks, and the offense and the defense do just enough to make it work, which is, by the way, playoff football. And I know the, the point that a lot of people would say is, yeah, but it's the Lions. Try that against the, the Saints. Here's the thing, though. They play up to the competition. Not always. They do have three losses. But in 13 wins, they have found a way to play up, or down to the competition and do just enough to find a way to win. And the fact that they're winning close games is very, very, very important. And yeah, there, there is probably, it's hard to say, but there is probably more benefit to finding a way to win a close game than in a blowout. You got to really dig deep and you got to really challenge yourself and stress yourself and all that. Now, there is the the mental side of it, the emotional side of we almost lost to the Lions and, you know, the whole national media and everybody saying we're not good enough to be here and all that stuff. I don't I don't know if that counteracts it or if that's a worse effect than the positive effect of, of winning a narrow victory. But I do think that that's what playoff is and getting practice in that exercise of we're down, we're getting beat up, we got to dig deep, we got to keep grinding, and then coming back and winning, that's, that's 100% playoff football. So yeah, it wasn't fun to watch, and I would have loved it if, if we did to the Lions what the Saints did to the Carolina Panthers. One week before the playoffs, we get lined up with a divisional opponent that's just down on their luck, and we just stand there and just kick them in the teeth over and over and over just for the fun of it, just because it makes us giggle every time we do it. And I would have enjoyed the giggling. I was ready for a day of giggling. Every touchdown, just giggling and and shaking my head and just saying things like, Oh, you... You crazy Packers, you did it again, you scoundrel. I was ready for that day. I was prepared. I had all those cheesy little lines lined up. Not really, but I, you know, I would have gotten there eventually. You know, where you casually get up and go grab some food in the middle of the game because, you know, that's what you can do. You you get a little swag when you're watching the game when they're beating them so bad. Like, I don't want to miss a touchdown, but it's just, it's my way of being like, I don't even care anymore. I mean, I super do, and I'm going to try to see the TV from the kitchen. But it's it's just the action of being like, don't even care, man. I'm going to go make a little, another beef sandwich. Not even hungry, but I'm going to show you this swag real quick. I wanted that. Got my beef sandwich swag on, man. What's going on in the game? I don't know, probably another touchdown. We'll find out when we get back in there when I feel like it. And then just sprint back to the living room because you probably did miss a touchdown. But if, if there's anything a playoff team needs, it's practice winning a playoff game. And I know it seems weird because it was the Lions, 
But that felt like, and that was a playoff game, and they win a lot of those playoff games. And you win those by having key players like really good pass rushers, talented corners, an intelligent, talented quarterback, a a ground game, a top-tier wide receiver. I mean, these are all the things that you turn to, right? If you got to get a stop, who do you look at? You need good coverage and you need a pass rush. Packers have it. You need to have a cerebral quarterback that knows what to do. (coughs) I'm choking. And has the ability to make the throw when it's there. I know he had a bad day, but he also had some really clutch throws, especially to Devontae. Just pinpoint. He, he can make that throw. you got to have a ground game to keep him honest, or at least a running back that can make plays like we saw in that little screen pass. Again, the number one wide receiver so that you can get those clutch third down conversions when you need it so that you can drive down and get those touchdowns. They have all these little pieces so that when it comes down to it, Whatever it is we need to close out this game, if we need a defense to get a stop, if we need the run game to grind out the clock, if we need a a quarterback-wide receiver combo and a little little dash of Jimmy Graham in there to try to get those first down conversions, they have just enough to keep doing all the little things regardless of what it is we need to do. The only real thing the Packers are going to struggle to do is come back from a large deficit because they don't seem to have that ability to take really big chunks like they have in the past. Right? If if it's 21-3... to in the third quarter, the ability to say, okay, I mean, maybe the defense can get some stops, but we got to just launch these balls down the field, get touchdowns in about five plays, you know, explosive plays on our side. That's the one thing that's maybe struggling. We get them, but it's, you know, I don't know if we could do it on command. But yeah, I, I, I do think that's a good way to look at it. Still disappointing, but that was very good playoff practice. Anyways, why don't we take a break right now? Lee, it's a little bit short on time. And so we'll take a break and we'll get to a few other little things. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details so dustin who is the Primo conversation starter in the group uh, also posted that I see a lot of mock drafts with Green Bay taking an inside linebacker with their first pick. I hope this isn't the case because we signed a proven guy in free agency. Same with tight end and defensive line. That would only leave wide receiver as our biggest need. And with how deep the wide receiver class is, I say double dip or even triple dip. Slight agreement, mostly disagreement on my part. First of all, I'm not sure who these proven free agents are at... um, linebacker tight end and defensive line i'm assuming with linebacker we're talking about bj goodson which i mean i could kind of see not wanting to take a and here's the other thing you don't pick a position in the draft that's just not how this works as i mentioned i think yesterday when you rank players you put them into tiers when your time comes up you look at the guys that are in your tier and you pick one if you don't want to pick one you need to try to get out of there if you can't, and I know this happened to Tennessee once with their wide receiver who they just can't get going, I forget his name, then you're forced to reach, which is the last thing you want to do. Number one, the number one goal is to take somebody in your tier. Number two goal is to trade out of that spot. And then number three goal would be to reach on a player. That is the last case scenario. Under no circumstances do you look at this and say, I've got four guys in this upper tier, but I want a wide receiver, so I'm going to reach on that next tier. Nobody's going to do that. Again, unless you have to. So the, the question for me is, in what case would I say, no, I don't want that, I'm going to reach? So if a wide receiver is in that tier, and we could talk about what's most important, wide receiver, linebacker, whatever, but just for the sake of, of what I'm going to talk about right now, and then maybe we could talk about that in the future, if there's a wide receiver in, in our given tier, then yes, we're taking a wide receiver. If there's a tackle, do I take him? Yes. In other words, would I skip a tackle so I could reach on a wide receiver? No, I would not. Interior offensive line, would you skip an interior offensive lineman? That you could say maybe, 
because we're potentially talking about a backup. Although you could be talking about that with a tackle as well, but still, it's it's a premium position. And if we, even if we do re-sign Brian Balaga, I don't know that it's more than like two years. So it, it's it's an iffy situation because you don't want a first round tackle to sit on the bench like at all. So that becomes complicated, I guess. Unless you get somebody that's extremely versatile that can play a lot of different positions from tackle, guard, to maybe even center. In which case, they are just the number one backup, possibly even taking somebody's spot. But either way, something becomes not great. If a tight end is there, do you skip the tight end and grab a wide receiver? No. I don't think there are any first-round tight ends. We'll have to see, but just saying. If there was a guy, let's just say there's only one guy in the top tier and he's a tight end. Do we take him? I think we do. Now, there's the question of, do you take a tight end in the first round? I don't see why you wouldn't. And I do think the Packers would. And I think a lot of this about the Packers don't do this in the first round is kind of not true. I just think it tends to be what the board is. And also, when you look at the tiers, there's probably other guys in those tiers that do have more positional value, which is why they take that. So it just becomes a numbers game. It's not that they would never take a linebacker or a running back in the first round. It's just that the only way in which they would is if it's number one a need, And number two, they're basically the only one available in that tier, and that just never really happens. And if you think about first-round linebackers, there's very few of them. Mostly we're talking, what, quarterbacks, pass rushers, tackles. These are the most important things because of their positional value. A lot of these positions, there's not even that many in them. And the odds that it's a need for the Packers that's in the tier basically by himself, it it just doesn't happen. But if it did happen, I think they would pull the trigger on a running back, tight end, linebacker, whatever. Maybe not running back this year because it's not a need. But you get my point. Quarterback. If it's just a quarterback, I would try to trade out of that spot. If I couldn't, I would reach on a wide receiver or whatever. I don't think I would take a quarterback. Now, I you know I, I think the Packers will, and maybe you should, because it is an extremely important position. And it is and it is one of those where people don't seem to mind so much if they're, you know, you have an extremely talented backup. So maybe you know like if apparently Tua is going to declare on the sixth I think he's going to go into the draft I think it would be foolish not to unless he genuinely believes he's going to fall into the second round but I think that's nonsense I don't think there's a team that's going to let him go into the second round I mean worst case scenario the same thing happens with Lamar Jackson where somebody's going to trade up into the first round just so they get that fifth year option but I think he's entirely too talented to to slip past all these teams that desperately need quarterbacks but if he did would you take Tua I suppose you probably should I don't know if I personally would, though. So I so I guess it depends how I'm answering this question. Is it me or the Packers? I think the Packers take Tua. I think that's a proven thing that they've learned. And really, I mean, 2020, there's no getting out of this contract. You, you're, you're losing $30 million if you cut them. Starting in 2021, there is some financial saving. And then by 2022, you can get to the point where it, it becomes... You save more money than your than dead money, so it becomes definitely feasible if it becomes an issue. So really, we're talking about three years on the bench, which is really what Rodgers had anyway. So maybe, and if the Packers have any questions, like a lot of fans do, that maybe Aaron Rodgers is kind of slipping a little bit, then quarterback becomes not only feasible but plausible. Because let's lock up a guy that we believe in now. Let's get him trained up, and you might even have like an Eli Manning situation where after maybe not in the first year. But let's say in 2022 or 2021, so 2020, we've got him on the bench. 2021, we don't want to get rid of Aaron Rodgers, but he ends up losing the job to Tua. And then in 2022, we trade Rodgers, right? And I know a lot of people don't want to hear that. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud, man. I'm not saying I think or I, or I want or any of that. I'm just thinking out loud. And let's, let's as a thought exercise, assume that maybe there is something wrong with Aaron Rodgers. Just for the sake of, of conversation, relax. If you can't handle it, just fast forward a little bit. But actually, that does become a little bit more plausible, because if you think about it, the contract is just too heady for for us to move on. But you could see a situation because we are in about that three year period. Now, generally, I'm thinking three years until the contract is up. But really, in this case, it's three years until the contract becomes kind of flexible to where trading becomes, you know, you're saving 22 million bucks in 2021. You got 17 million in dead money, but you're saving some. And then you would have a guy like Tua or Love or whoever that um, are on the rookie contracts, you can afford the dead money. And then by the next year, you have no more dead money. That contract is completely gone. You've got year uh, four of the rookie contract. So you've got two more years of, of rookie contract if you ex- exercise the fifth year option. So yeah, I, I, I do think that's feasible. And, and really, and it's funny, I thought Aaron Nagler was messing around. I don't know. He, apparently he hates Rodgers these days. I don't know what's going on. I, I, I saw something. I thought he was joking, but there's been a lot of anger. He's convinced they're taking a quarterback. 
And maybe I'm misreading it and he is joking and it's just a very long and um, pointed joke. But um, so that that's his analysis that Rodgers is just completely falling off. But it's not impossible and it will be interesting. If there is a quarterback that makes it, it's going to be one of those hold your breath situations. And we'll have to wait and see. And of course, it, it, it doesn't always answer the question because you don't know what the Packers think. You know, maybe Tua slides and it's like, well, this is the moment of truth. And it turns out they didn't even have him on the board because of his injury. So you never really know, but it will be interesting to see. Running back. No, I don't think we take a running back. I think if it's there's just a running back or you and you can't trade out, you reach for a, a wide receiver or whatever the case is. Fullback, that's not even in the conversation. Those are guys you don't even start drafting until, what, the fourth round at the earliest? Uh, on the defensive side, would you take a defensive tackle? I absolutely would. You you probably know I'm a big fan of Raekwon Davis. I just really like him. He's purely a run defender, so I understand if the Packers don't want him or whatever, or if you're not a fan. But it, in general, if there is a dominant defensive tackle, I would take him. I know we've invested a lot, and I know we just paid Dean, so we got Kenny Clark, and we got Dean, and we play a lot of Zadarius inside, so it's kind of like how much of this guy is actually going to play. But, I mean, just, just get a, a, a... Assume the guy is even a little bit close to what Kenny Clark is. Would you really be upset about two of those guys and then rotating occasionally Dean or Tyler Lancaster or Zadarius, depending on the situation? No, I'm, I'm, if, if there is a defensive tackle... Because I really think defensive tackle is one of the most important positions. It's, it's, it's rising to the level of edge rusher because that's what they are now. They're interior edge rushers, which doesn't make sense, but that's what they are. There's, there's a slight emphasis on run defense a little more than edge rushers have, but they both do the same job just from a different position. Get to the quarterback and stop the guy when he's running at you. You still got to shed blocks to get to the quarterback. You got to shed blocks to make tackles. And so an interior edge rusher, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna take him. I would not say no to a tackle and then reach on a wide receiver. I just wouldn't. And, and again, I'm not saying it's more important than wide receiver. That's not the conversation I'm having. Positionally, it's way more important than a wide receiver. But the question is, would you pass on a more talented defensive tackle? Would you pass on a Kenny Clark to go after a wide receiver? That's probably, it's kind of unfair. Because if I said it in terms of would you pass on a Kenny Clark to get a Devontae Adams, probably people would say I would take Devontae Adams. But whatever. I don't think you pass on a more talented defensive tackle. Edge rusher is very, very, very tricky. Because it's so hard to say no to a top-tier edge rusher. Right, if, let's say a guy that is like a top 10 talent on our board makes it to 29 or 30 or 31. I, I don't know. I'm trying to make it closer so it seems a little bit more realistic. But a guy that we valued around 14 makes it to 32. And he's an edge rusher. And he's very good. But we got Zadarius, we got Preston, and we got Rashawn. Even if you don't like Rashawn, he's a first-round pick. So I, I really don't know the answer to that question. I think in that situation, I really, really, really want to trade. And I think you could probably get one because I doubt they're the only team that sees this edge rusher as being primo talented. But forcing myself to answer my own question, do you pass on a premium edge rusher and reach? I I guess, but I hate that so much. I really, really hate that, but I guess you have to. Um, corners and safeties, kind of similar. Corner I would probably take. And it's not because I dislike Kevin King or any of that. It's just that, I mean, Tremont's getting up in age. If he's a boundary guy, we know we can put Jair in the slot. If, so if we go two corners, we can do Jair and new guy. And if we go three, we can go Kevin King and new guy with Jair in the slot. So that's not a problem for me. I'm taking a corner if it becomes, you know, he's he's our top option um, and a wide receiver is below us in the next tier. I'm taking a corner, absolutely. Safety, I would also do that because we do a lot of three safety. Um, although I do like the guys we have. I think Will Redmond does a good job. Ibrahim Campbell I like. But I like them as sort of that second tier. We could absolutely upgrade. We could upgrade to the point at which Adrian Amos or Darnell Savage become the two and three. Right? We can get our number one and have Savage and, and Amos as, as... I mean, that, that would be incredible. So basically, in summary, for the most part, I'm never going to reach on a wide receiver just because I want a wide receiver. And that's true of every position. It's not just that. I wouldn't reach for a linebacker. I wouldn't reach for, for anything. Now, there is a, a reverse situation where you have lesser um, lesser important positions that are in that upper tier. Would you reach on a more premium position? Like, let's say we are moving on from Brian Balog, and you have a top-tier linebacker and wide receiver. Is there any chance in which you would maybe pass on them and get the tackle? Strictly speaking, to the best player available, you're not supposed to, but you would have to strongly consider it. Because we don't have Brian Balaga 
you put us in this mess, you better get us out of it. Because if we don't get this guy, we're not getting a tackle into the second round, and who knows if there's even a guy available that's any good in the second round. You might look at your board and there's nobody in your first or next tier that's a tackle. And then what, you go to the third round, or do you reach two tiers back? To get a third round guy in the second round, you're really getting yourself in trouble. So in, in that case where you're in a real big pinch to get a real quality player, you might have to. But gen- I get a lot of questions about the draft. Would you do this? Would you take this? It's almost impossible, and, and it's it's. I try to answer the question as best as I can, but it always comes down to best player available. And again, best player available isn't just, you know, I've got them ranked 1, 2, and 3, so if, if 2 and 3 are available, you take 2. That's not the case. If 2 and 3 are in the same tier, and 2 is a running back and 3 is a wide receiver, I'm going to take number 3 over number 2. Because even though I have number 2 graded a little bit higher, they're in that same quality tier, right? Pro Bowler, or whatever the tier would be. You take the Pro Bowl wide receiver or the Pro Bowl running back. So that's the framework. This is what I've explained or talked about is the context at which I look at the draft and how things operate. So when you ask a question like, do you think we should take a wide receiver in the first round? The question kind of doesn't even make sense. If the question is, is would you pass on a wide receiver in the first round? No, I would take a wide receiver in the first round, but there's a lot of other questions that need to be answered. And I know because I have a, a mock draft YouTube, or uh, I did have a mock draft YouTube channel. I haven't used utilized it in a long time. Too much work. By the way, any video people in the, in the house, let me know, because I wouldn't mind getting that started up again. I just don't want to put the time into it. So if you want to help with that, Maybe we can fire it back up. Could probably even compensate you for it. But anyways, I I know by doing a lot of mock drafts, typically what fans want to do is reach for the position. It doesn't matter. It it just happened. I think I'm doing a mock right now in the Facebook group, and we just do polls to do pick by pick. And I think the last pick was the Eagles taking a cornerback, and he was like 15 down the line. But he was the next available cornerback, so they took him. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I know the Falcons have... have, uh, whatever his, his name is, Blankenship or whatever, um, has come out and said, oh, Blank is his name. The GM, though, is uh, uh, Dimitrov. He's come out and said we, we pick based on need. Now, I'm sure there's always an element of need and best player available for every team. It's just kind of a spectrum. But you, you got to have some kind of a context of what we're talking about here. So, you, In other words, no team and no body really should be locked into a position in January. You can't really make a decision until you get to the pick, and at that point, you can kind of make an, an assessment. So, anyways, I'm going to cut it there. Uh, Got to get going here. You folks have yourselves a fantastic Thursday. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>